Take your Bibles, look at Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. And specifically, look at verse 36, uh, 36 through 38. Acts 2, 36 through 38. Acts 2.36, the Bible says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now then, or now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Young Patrick, whose birth name, according to later history, was Maywin Sakat. Anybody know who that is? St. Patrick. His real name was Maywin Sakat. He was the son of a Christian deacon born in Scotland and was kidnapped at age 16 by Irish pirates. He worked as a slave shepherd in Ireland after his kidnapping for six years. But all through that time he prayed, and every day he asked God's forgiveness until he heard, presumably, according to uh, uh, some of the history, he supposedly heard a divine voice or a divine leading telling him that, there was a ship that was bound for his home that he could be on if he was able to get to it. The bad news was the ship was 200 miles away from where he was, but after planning and plotting a little bit, he decided to make his attempt to escape, which he did, and he was able to meet the ship and he returned home. There's two popular lies about Patrick that are propagated on our society, the first lie that we hear all the time is that Patrick was Irish. He was not. This is totally made up story to fit the modern narrative of this March festival like we celebrate or some celebrate today. It was sometime later that Patrick felt called as a missionary to return to the land of the Irish to minister to them and he is a well-known figure because he brought the gospel of the Lord Jesus to the people of Ireland, and he established a Christian Bible-believing Christian church there. So the first lie is that he was Irish, wasn't. Second lie that we hear all the time is that he was Catholic, and that's not true either. Patrick was actually born in Scotland, and there's no evidence that he was ever associated with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church definitely uh, claims him as their own by citing history of Patrick's travel to Italy, However, there's no proof of him ever traveling to Italy. And it's even said that Pope Celestine or Celestine gave him the mission of returning to Ireland to convert the Irish to the true faith, giving St. Patrick his uh, apostolic benediction. All this sounds very good, but it's untrue. And so it was actually 200 years after Patrick's death that, writing, that writings about Patrick attempted and they found their way into the Catholic writings of the churches. But it wasn't until 200 years after he had passed that this writing started to occur. Nobody knows exactly for sure why it found its way in after 200 years, but it did. His accomplishments and successes in his missionary efforts were not written about and acclaimed by the Roman Catholic popes and historians of his time. And this kind of is strong evidence to the fact that he was never uh, under the Catholic authority and never was a missionary of Catholic descent. Had he been, there would have been writing in official records of the church, and none of that exists uh, to this day or has ever been found. Being that Patrick's father was also a deacon, and that Catholic deacons were forbidden from marriage, it seems very unlikely that Patrick would have been from Catholic roots. In 305 AD, the Council of Elvira states the following, It is decided that marriage be altogether prohibited to bishops, priests, and deacons, or to all clerics placed in the ministry, and that they keep away from their wives 
or that they keep away from their wives and not beget children. Whosoever does this shall be deprived of the honor of clerical office. So therefore, it's pretty unlikely that he was ever from Catholic roots. Because at that time, it was a big thing. Patrick was apparently never canonized either, even though many websites list Patrick as one of the official saints of the Catholic Church, there's never been found any proof in writing that that ever happened. So where did Patrick stand with this Christendom? Well, he stood on the Word of God. All accounts point to the fact that Patrick was a true Bible believer, and in his own writings, uh, we find much evidence to this. And based on those writings, uh, there's no mentioning of, or no counsel or creed besides the Bible alone. Uh, we can assert that Patrick took the Bible as his sole authority and gave credit to no worldly authority when he was in Ireland. It seems to have been customary in the, the, uh, the uh, Celtic churches of early times in Ireland as well as Scotland to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as the day of rest from labor. And it says they obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. A portion of his own writings, of Patrick's own writings, say this about his core beliefs. For there is no other God, nor ever was before, now, nor shall ever be hereafter, but God the Father, unbegotten and without beginning, in whom all things began, whose are all things as we have been taught, and his Son, Jesus Christ, who manifestly always existed with the Father, before the beginning of time, in the Spirit with the Father, indescribably begotten before all things, and all things visible and invisible were made by him. He was made man, conquered death, and was received into heaven to the Father who gave him all power over every name in heaven and on earth and in hell, so that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God in whom we believe, and we look to his imminent return to judge the living and the dead and to render to each according to his deeds. He poured out his Holy Spirit on us in abundance, the gift and pledge of immortality which makes the believers and the faithful into the sons of God, co-heirs of Christ, who is revealed and we worship one God in the Trinity of his holy name. That was from Patrick's own writing, and so I think we can see that Patrick uh, had some understanding of the word of God. Uh, but just a little bit of history about today, I thought that was kind of fun to just look at that because I know there's a lot of people who firmly believe that St. Patrick is truly a Catholic saint and that he did great accolades for the Catholic Church. And as a matter of fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember this, but I believe today is supposed to be a, a what do they call it, a, a day of, what's the word? Um, they have a special name for today. One of the, yeah, days of obligation. Uh, and so, anyhow, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting to me that so many folks um, go through their life believing things that have no factual basis. And the sad part is it's because they've never taken the time to look. They've just believed what they've heard. Anyway, you're in, you're in Acts chapter 2. Uh, those verses that we just read, I want to call back your attention to that place, and especially verse 37. The Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many times have we read over these two verses in the book of Acts? If I was to guess, I would dare say we've read over them many, many times. But have we ever stopped to consider the significance of these two verses? Uh, they come as a result of Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. Uh, if we look at the entire chapter of chapter 2 of Acts, uh, they come as a result of Peter's preaching but the Holy Ghost fills the believers there and the work of the gospel begins with a new power from on high. It's a mighty work. And Peter actually began this whole, his whole preaching narrative in chapter 2 and verse 14. And he preaches all the way until verse 36 where he proclaims those verses that I just read to you. 
uh, in verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Remember, at this time, many of the people listening were, were Jewish people. And uh, interestingly also, whenever tongues are spoken about in the word of God, generally there's Jews present. And so here he says, let, it, let the whole, all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So you can see with that one statement, he's addressing Jewish folks there, and, uh, which brings us to the two verses of our text. Uh, let me ask you a question as we start out. How many of you like pain? How many of you like to be in pain? Raise your hand. <laughs> None of us like to be in pain. But the fact is, as we get older, we seem to find more pain. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I, I think I told somebody this the other day, but when I did the floor in the bathroom here a few weeks back, I put that new floor down. I mean, gee whiz, the next couple of days I could hardly stand up straight. Crawling around on my hands and knees, right? But, uh, hey, none of us like pain, but truthfully, none of us probably would admit honestly that we like it. But yet, here in our text, the Bible says that after Peter preached, those gathered around under the sound of his preaching, the Bible says, were pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. Uh, none of us like pain, but God gave us the sensation of pain in our body to alert us to problems. When we have pain in our body, it means something's wrong. It's sort of God's way of telling us that there's something wrong within our body when we have pain. And so our response to pain is oftentimes just to dumb it down with a couple of Advil. Amen? And oftentimes we don't even think about it. We have a headache, we take Advil or some other thing. Or maybe Steve takes Anison because that's more in his time. Amen? <laughs> but the truth is, we don't oftentimes pay a lot of attention. We just keep on going. Amen? But we should, if we're wise, we should determine the root of our pain and why we're getting the pain, find the root of the problem. Painkillers may work for a while, but eventually the pain will return if the root is not dealt with. Every one of us knows that if we, if we have an injury of some type, uh, and some of those things require certain things to be done, and if it doesn't happen, uh, it'll, it'll cause us uh, greater pain in the future. Uh, most of you, I think everyone here knows Brother Tom Green, and he broke his ankle, his ankle several years ago and never went to the doctors. And just fig figured it would, you know, he didn't know he had broken it because he didn't really get it checked out, but after some... Some recent testing and checks, he found out that he had broken it many years ago. So now he has to, he's got to go and get an ankle replacement on April the 12th, I think it is. And so what's the point? Hey, when you have pain, sometimes it's a good thing to go and figure out why you're having the pain uh, and why, uh, why it continues. Uh, but once the source is identified and the correct treatment is applied, the pain can usually be eliminated. Not always, but generally. And the same is true in our spiritual life. And this is especially true with unsafe people. Example, a sermon on Jesus' return might not excite an unbeliever. If we had a group of unbelievers here and I talked to them about the blessed hope, and I went into a long detailed explanation of the blessed hope that Jesus Christ has, imminent, has promised an imminent return, and one day he's coming back, and one day he's going to take us all with him and uh, so shall we ever be, as the Bible talks about. That might not excite unbelievers very much because they don't have any concept of what that really means. But for we Christians, it should excite us. It does excite us. It, it might cause uh, uh, us to be uh, joyful and excited and, and, and have anticipation. It's a thrill for us who believe when we hear about the blessed hope. But for unbelievers, it probably won't move them very much. Now, not every unbeliever is going to be unaffected. Some will be affected. As a matter of fact, some of them, it might cause them great pain and anxiety. Because that's exactly what happened here in Acts chapter 2. When Peter preached, you had a whole bunch of people that were listening. And some were unaffected. 
But the Bible says in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. So that means that it affected some that were under the sound of Peter's preaching. It might cause great pain and anxiety for an unbeliever. When an unbeliever hears that Jesus is coming to judge the world of its sin, it sends fear into many of the world's unsaved. Now again, that doesn't mean everybody. But you and I know from our own personal experience, when we were talked about or told about the Lord Jesus and the fact that we were unsaved and that we were in need of a Savior and that our sins needed to be paid for and somebody took the Bible and showed us all those verses with regard to that, it caused us concern. Hence, the Spirit began to work and we were uh, gloriously birthed into the family of God because of the Spirit's conviction on us. That unsettled feeling in the pit of the stomach of the unsaved is what causes that pain. It's God's way of alerting them of a root problem all men have that must be dealt with. Now tonight everyone here I believe has dealt with that problem so uh, you understand it. But people who are unsaved when they hear about these things that Peter preached about and other things in the word of God... It's going to create concern in some people's hearts and minds. It's a signal to them that tells them that not all is well in their souls. You know, our modern culture desires to know that all is well. They love to be told that everything is going to be okay. Psychiatrists, psychologists, they make literally millions of dollars every year telling people it's going to be okay. And the sad part is, psychology, modern psychology, does not talk about spiritual things most often. And even when you go to a supposed Christian counselor, uh, they mix the two. They mix a little bit of psychology and a little bit of spirituality, and it's kind of like a cocktail that they serve you. But what folks really need is they need the Word of God, and that's why biblical counseling is always the best route to go if you're in need of something. But the truth is this. For an unsafe person, not everything is going to be okay. And if you tell them everything is going to be okay, then in fact, what are you doing? You're actually telling them something that's not true. Unless a serious change is made in an unbeliever's life, everything is definitely not going to be okay. You know, loving people as we should means that we must be graciously Now that's the key, graciously honest with them about their future. And if we're not forthright with unbelievers regarding their spiritual condition, they could spend an eternity separated uh, from God. You know, it's a good thing to preach messages about the love of God and the relationship with Christ will lift them up out of depression, discouragement, and all other low points that they may face in their life. But it is also our responsibility To tell them the truth. And unfortunately, that's not what many of the world's churches are doing today. They're telling them everything's going to be okay. They'll tell them this. If you just love people, and you just treat everybody well, everything will be okay. That's the mantra of the liberals. They basically would like you to believe that If I love you and you love me, there's nothing else we need to worry about. But that is not the truth, according to the Word of God. It's our responsibility to tell them the truth. And when God gives us the opportunity, we tell unbelievers, and we must tell unbelievers that that, that their sin separates them from a holy God. So the question is this, how does that best happen? Or how is that best handled? As much as unsaved people may be likable, And we may even enjoy being with them. The unsaved are not all right with God. Again, the world is telling them that they are. They'll tell them if you're just a good person and you treat people good, you're honest and you work hard, and stay away from all the vices that people are involved with, that everything's going to be okay and you're all right with God. Well, that's just not the truth. We're not in the business of giving the unsaved painkillers. 
We're in the business of giving the unsaved what they need to deal with their root issue. And we must get to the root of the problem and help them deal with their sinful condition. You know, the sinful condition cannot be changed by a motivational sermon. A pat on the back. You can't change somebody's sinful condition by just giving them a motivational sermon and telling them, you know, the best is yet to come and the best is in you and, and all the other stuff that we hear from the TV preachers on a regular basis. A pat on the back for an unsaved person isn't going to change their sinful condition. If you go up and you put your, head, you put your arm around them, give them a hug on the neck and slap them on the back and tell them, hey, hey man, everything's going to be okay, that doesn't change their sinful condition. We must be like Peter on the day of Pentecost and allow the Holy Spirit to do its intended work. So what was Peter's part? What did Peter, uh, Peter, yeah, what did Peter, Peter tell the folks that were gathered there that day? If you go back to verse 14 of Acts chapter 2, notice what the verse says. It says, but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, notice these next words, be this known unto you. And, and then he said, hearken unto my words. Peter wasn't a motivational speaker. He was basically getting ready to cut loose with some truth that most of them gathered on that day had never heard before. Verse 15, he says, For these are not drunken, as you suppose. Now, he was talking about the fact that, that these uh, men had received the Holy Spirit and they were able to speak in the tongues or speak in the languages of those many native people that were gathered there that day. And so he's re making reference to that here when he says, For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. Did you notice these first, from verse 15 to verse, uh, to verse uh, uh, 20, what is, what is missing from Peter's messages? As you read those four or five verses there. What's missing? And this is a key. I believe it's one of the keys why Peter's message was so well received on this day. There's nothing in those verses attacking the people that were listening. There's no direct correlation to the people that were there. In other words, Peter didn't say, you know, you folks are sinners and you need to be saved. And if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. That's not in those verses. What instead is he doing? He's talking about the whole universe, if you will, of what God has in store for all who are unsaved. Look at the verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved again he didn't single anybody out ye men of Israel hear those words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered so in other words it's all about Jesus it's all about what he did for us and for these folks that were gathered. And then he goes into verse 25. He brings up David. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. This message that Peter is preaching has great power in it. It has uh, many signals, if you will, of things to come in the future. It certainly has enough in it to cause people to question. But none of it talks directly about 
them as individuals before Peter that day. So we must be like Peter when we try to witness to somebody, as he did on the day of Pentecost, and allow instead the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God to do its intended work if it's going to be done on that day. There's only one remedy for the unsaved, and that's repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's their only hope. So the question we ask is, how do we bring somebody who's, in their own minds, okay, because everyone's told them that they are, how do we bring them from that place to a place where they come under the Spirit's conviction and the Spirit of God begins to do a work in their heart and brings them under the conviction? And how is it that the conviction causes them pain in their heart like it did for these that are gathered according to verse 37. Peter did not attack the listeners. He simply told them the truth that they needed to know. That's all he did. And upon hearing the truth, some were convicted. And pain entered their heart. As the Bible says they were pricked in their heart. That means that they had, uh, they had the, uh, the, a pain in their heart. And I don't mean the, lizard, the, the literal physical heart that's pumping in their chest. But you know, as the Bible talks about heart, you know, sort of their inner man or the inner being and uh, the things that affect their activities and their actions, Peter simply told them the story of Jesus. And that pain that was created in their hearts, what had happened? What, caused, what, what was the result of Peter's preaching? Verse 38, excuse me, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what happened when the pain came? They cried out for salvation. They said to Peter and the rest, Brethren, what shall we do? What do we have to do to take care of this, this prick that's come into our heart, this pain that's there? By the way, the word pricked in verse 37 is a word that means to, to stab down deep. To puncture, to wound, to, to sting, to pierce when we think of the word pricked, many times, what do we think about? I don't know about you, but I remember working out in the bushes, and you get into the blackberry bushes, and you get all those prickers from the bushes on you, and that's the prick I think of when I see this word. But that's not the word that's being described here, and I'll tell you that, show you that in just a minute. But this word pricked has is, 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 is got a stronger meaning than that. The only other time in the New Testament that this word is used or translated, it's actually not translated in, in, the, in the other place, John 19, 39. And that's when the Lord Jesus is on the cross and he's about ready to give up the ghost and the soldier takes his spear and pierces the Lord's side. There, this same root word is translated pierced, where here in Acts chapter 2, it's translated pricked. Of course, this was when the soldier, like I said, pierced the side of Jesus. And when he thrust in his spear, it went all the way to Jesus' heart and lungs. Luke uses the word pricked when he tells us that it was a deeply affected pain here in Acts chapter 2. In other words, it was pain that had a deep effect on the unbelievers that they felt that day. You know, this type of piercing or pricking is also it would produce an excruciating pain in the receiver of this type of a wound. Now, you've heard people say when they get into a disagreement with other people, they'll say, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you said that to me, Alice. What you said just cut me in my heart. You ever had somebody tell you that or something similar? That's a favorite expression. But 
sometimes people's words can cut to us, cut to our heart, and it can cause us pain. Uh, many times it's mental pain or mental anguish. But this, this word that was used here, pricked in Acts chapter 2, caused the unbelievers under the sound of Peter's preaching, it caused so much pain to them that they had to cry out for help. And that's what we see in verse 37. Men and brethren, what shall we do? How do we get rid of this pain that's been created? How do we get rid of this feeling, this, this feeling that's deep down in my soul that tells me that something is bad wrong? Peter responded in verse 38, Repent and be baptized. And by the way, that word repent is simply Peter was saying, Hey, you've got to change your thinking. You know, that's really our responsibility as God's messengers. To take the Word of God to the unbelieving world and get them to change their mind. Now, it's not up to us to change their mind. That's the Spirit of God's job. But our job is to take them the message. Take them the information. But do it in, like I said in the beginning of our message tonight, take it to them in a gracious sort of way. And I believe the best example of the graciousness that I'm talking about, or what the Bible talks about, is what we see from chapter Acts chapter 2, verse 14, all the way down to verse number 36, where we talked about our scriptures tonight. <clears throat> Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And by the way, we need to make sure people understand that baptism isn't part of the salvation process. It's simply an act of obedience after salvation. And salvation is uh, wholly dependent on the Lord's work, nothing that we do. It's just simply a public profession of faith. And of course here, I believe he's also talking about the spirit baptism. In fact, that they're baptized by the Spirit of God into the family of God. Um, but this is how we ought to approach soul winning. We, we, we must, we must, we must get rid of all of the man-made ideas that have been propagated on the church for years now about how you, you have to take them down the Romans road. Hey, there's a time for the Romans road. There's a time to share those verses of Scripture. But before they even show any interest whatsoever, I don't believe that's the way. I believe the Bible's narrative is clear and that if we read through Acts chapter 2 in its entirety, we see the best method of reaching the lost for Christ and that's simply by telling them what the future holds. Because I'll tell you this, most people, if you go to them and you say, hey, listen, and you don't start out with, hey, I know you're not a church person, but you say to them simply this, hey, do you realize what the future holds? And most people on that are going to say, well, I'm not really sure, but, you know, what are you talking about? That opens the door for you to begin to tell them some of the things that Peter told these believers that were gathered here. You know, you pick the words, you pick the, the narrative that you want to use, but stay away from them personally for a time being until you get some traction on the Spirit of God. Let the Spirit bring them to the place where you focus down and drill down on them specifically. I don't know, I just feel like that's the Bible way. But this, I believe, is how we should approach soul winning. And I think if we would do that and get rid of the, the personal attack on the person right out of the blocks, we probably would be more effective. Many times the way we do it now is the first thing we talk about is keeping the person out of hell. Sadly, most people don't think they're going there. So we're basically trying to get them to buy off on something that most people don't feel affects them. But let's tell them about the great things that God has in store for the future. And then basically bring this, the conversation around to the fact, hey, do you want to be a part of that or not? 
And I believe the Spirit will do the work that's intended to do. I believe if we'll do this, we'll see more fruit in our soul winning efforts. So that's my challenge for you tonight. It was a little shorter than usual, but I've told you what I wanted to tell you tonight. So let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your blessing of your word. And Father, we, we thank you that you have outlined so clearly, Father, the track that we should run on when we do the work that you called us to do. And Father, when we get off of the track that you prescribed in your word is when we, we don't see effective things happen. And so, Lord, we want to be effective in our efforts to reach folks for you. And Lord, I believe if we would just simply keep to the word of God and stay away from man's books, we would probably be better served to reach others for Christ. And Father, we want to see our church grow. We want to see folks saved. And Father, we're here for that purpose. And Father, we believe that we try to keep as best we know how the truth of your word. And, and Lord, tonight I just ask that you might give us wisdom about that. And that, Father, in the coming weeks as the weather begins to change, that you might use us in the church to reach more folks. And so, Lord, we ask your help on that, and we, we give it all to you because, Lord, without your process or without you being in the process, so Lord, we're going to be, uh, Lord, doing things for nothing. So help us tonight, Father, as we go. Bring us back safely at the appointed time, and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.